Thanks for joining in uh, the Sydney Institute's uh, continuing series of virtual meetings at a time of pandemic. And today we have um, two speakers. Tanvir Ahmed makes a welcome return to the Institute. Um, and Monica Dumont makes a welcome first appearance at the Sydney Institute. I'll introduce uh, both our speakers uh, briefly. Tanvir Ahmed is a psychiatrist who practices in private practice in Sydney and at the Bankstown Community Hospital in Sydney. Um, among other things, he's a Sky News contributor, a columnist for the Australian Financial Review, and an uh, adjunct lecturer at the University of New South Wales in Sydney, and the author of In Defence of Shame, which is his third book, and we'll be talking about that today under the topic Shame and, to and Today's World. And Monica Dumit is a lawyer by training with a degree from the University of Sydney. She's practiced law for about a decade, is currently Director of Public Affairs and Engagement at the, Archdi at the Catholic Archdiocese of Sydney, is a columnist for the Catholic Weekly and an adjunct senior lecturer at Notre Dame University in Sydney. So we're going to lead off first with Tanvir, who will talk for about 15 minutes about his book and related matters. We'll go to Monica, who will talk for about the same length, and then we'll have a discussion. And thanks to those members who have sent in their questions for today. Here we go, Tanvir. Well, thanks very much, uh, Jared. It's always a pleasure to be speaking at the Sydney Institute, and I, and I thank Jared and Anne for the opportunity once more, and also their pivot in sort of maintaining their important work of promoting intelligent discussion uh, of the spectrum, of, of the complete spectrum of ideas uh, in spite of the COVID-19 restrictions. Now, the topic of discussion today is shame, and in a, um, uh, you know, in a unsurprising coincidence, I've happened to just have written a book about it, uh, and I'm essentially, I guess my talk is primarily a bit of a pricey, a bit of a summary of some of the major themes surrounding that book. Now, I've always found the topic of interest. Uh, it's always been apparent, so my background, say, as a Bangladeshi Muslim, albeit fairly secular, uh, when you grow up in quite a traditional ethnic community, uh, social regulation in, say, more collectivist, conformist sort of culture is especially strict. And I guess shame has great utility in such an environment. So I certainly grew up looking at shame in a very negative way, and, and that's arguably how it's usually been uh, presented or discussed in Western societies. But part of the book was me sort of almost arguably coming to terms with shame, think, kind of getting a broader sense of its place and its uh, wider usefulness, if you like. Now, we should distinguish what we mean by shame. Now, as humans, we have self-conscious emotions. And by that I mean things like guilt, humiliation, embarrassment, uh, and they exist on a spectrum. So shame varies from guilt in two key ways. Now one is that shame implies an audience. So it's quite group facing. That's one way to think of shame. Whereas guilt relies on a sort of private absorption of a set of value and reflection upon that um, if there are any transgressions. Now, the other aspect of shame is that it's characterised by what's known in psychology as a global attribution. So by that we mean it's a, it's a, it's a kind of a, it's a mark or a blow to the whole sense of self and not just about a specific act which guilt tends to be associated with. So an example might be, say, I'm, uh, say I bake a cake and it, it, it goes awry. Uh, and I might feel guilty and I might sort of think, okay, well, I'm not much of a baker. Whereas shame, if I was ashamed of it, it, I might interpret that as, well, I'm a bad mother or a father or a bad parent, something like that. So that's an example of a more global attribution. Now, I, I think shame is sort of diffusely re-emerging in recent decades. And there's, I mean, it's a function of a range of things, but one of it is certainly a political tribalism. Uh, which has been reinforced by a lot of online information flows. And I think that's where things like cancel culture, which I, I think a lot of people associate modern shame with. But part of the reason my interest in shame, it's actually a great proxy to think about our relationship to several areas. And one is our relationship to groups. So what does group identity mean in a society that is primarily about the individual and uh, our, our relationship to a civic state, 
how do we deal with groups, how do we connect to groups, how do we manage group identity, which, which is an innate desire um, for humans. The other aspect shame overlaps with is a moral language. And I think this is a very interesting for a psychiatrist because very often as a psychiatrist we're dealing with people and trying to almost sift through quite a medical language, but we're trying to then interpret the broad range of human experience, including, say, metaphysical, spiritual, uh, all manner of, um, uh, I guess, idioms of thinking about the human experience. And sometimes, even though it, it, it's sort of helpful for us on one respect, one aspect I see in my work where people are increasingly, and it's arguably a marker of our success, where people have become so medicalized or psychologized, they use such a psychological language, that it can be actually quite limited. It can be quite a limited way of thinking about, say, adversity, suffering, trauma, um, and, and, and the various, uh, say, vicissitudes, if I can say that word, of, uh, of um, day-to-day life. And the final thing I'd say it overlaps with, uh, at least what I've written about, is primitive or negative emotions. And by that I mean things like anger, disgust, um, uh, aggression, and shame overlaps with that too. And uh, one of the things I talk about here is that we've had a sort of a half century of positivity. And uh, part of that it was a reaction to the Holocaust. So some of the key figures, Maslow was one. It, there was almost a real urge for a host of thinkers in the 50s and 60s that as a reaction to the Holocaust that we needed a more positive, a kind of more refreshing view of man and as a kind of direct response. And that's driven potentially a half century of positivity. And, and that, you know, there's a sophisticated way of thinking about that and a less sophisticated way of that. But at a very, in the broad culture, that's acted to almost stifle or stigmatize of what we might consider primitive or negative emotions. Um, and that's, I think, had genuine um, effects on some of my work. And I talk about something like self-harm, which often overlaps with people not being able to tolerate negative emotions. Um, uh, and, and that's something that's been on the rise in recent decades. I mean, say, in, in terms of a political point of view, we know the left often focused on those who transgress boundaries of political correctness, whereas the right might have preferred different targets, such as welfare fraud. Public health advocates had, had, have, have had greater tolerance for fat shaming or ostracizing smokers. Meanwhile, shaming associated with sexuality, which is its original iteration in the biblical story of Adam, Adam and Eve, has become increasingly rare. So that's a very interesting trend. So discussions around shame to some extent indicate, indicate a yearning for a moral language stripped bare from the decline of religion. So we remain morally inarticulate and existential despair has been poached by the more medicalised language of mental health. And what I referred to earlier, the elevation of positivity has further stigmatised emotions um, like shame. Now, I guess in our coronavirus time, I and mean, this is something I've spoken to the Sydney Institute about before, that there'll no doubt be a rise in psychological ailments in the face of sort of economic despair in particular. Um, and, but some of my patients with anxiety disorders haven't necessarily deteriorated, interestingly, partly because their distress is no longer individualised, but is now shared. So they have a more shared sense of threat. But also the socially anxious, are spared some of the performative strains of modern life. Because a service economy demands a lot of performance. Uh, and in the book, I, I call that a marketing orientation. Uh, so for a lot of people where that's you know, quite challenging, it's, uh, there's actually a respite from that in the current sort of restrictions. So these vary from, the, say, the heightened focus of self-presentation in the workplace to the sort of scrutiny of chance encounters. So just as coronavirus exposes the fault lines and weaknesses of each society it, it invisibly penetrates, it's functioned as something of an exclamation mark on a half century of social and economic liberalism. If Brexit and Trump were initial portents, an, epi an epidemic that has stymied individual autonomy to some degree has potentially kind of uh, slammed a, another historical door. Uh, so COVID-19 in, in its uncaring destruction has further highlighted Douglas Murray's lament about modern liberalism and his quote, the feeling that the story has run out. So I guess the broad point is the language of individual rights 
is kind of being um, uh, stymied or diluted by, by the priorities of public health, which is dependent a bit more on mutual um, obligation. Um, uh, and it's within this context of a more united resistance against a collective threat, the usefulness of a gentle shame is, is being highlighted. And this is where, probably the last century or so, there's been an argument that shame is not terribly useful in a society that is so diverse increasingly lives in a sort of privatised suburbia. So there's no real shared morality. So suddenly we actually have an unusual situation we have where we have a shared public health version of morality. So the term COVIDiot, hashtag COVIDiot, sort of merged online earlier in the year. It's been used thousands of times since to sort of criticise any sort of behaviour deemed errant, uh, what, what's been called pandemic shaming. It's been used to expose, say, drunk spring breakers flouting advice in America to those attending sort of a stereophonic concert in Manchester. Public officials have been forced to resign, not living up to their own advice, be it the Chief Medical Officer of Scotland, uh, Don Harwin here in New South Wales, was uh, exposed but uh, uh, later exonerated. Uh, even wayward rugby league players, well known for scandals involving sex or violence, were termed COVIDiots on the front page of Sydney's Daily Telegraph after flouting health protocols. So whilst sideline critics might argue tyranny describes the restrictions imposed by public health authorities, the priorities of such officials certainly hold sway right now, and some of the acts of social distancing and appropriate hygiene have fallen into the realm of public law and order. You know, even the act of targeted coughing is, is a kind of an assault. So in terms of shame, so the, the stigmatisation of shame is also important to think about in a multicultural society where we, we increasingly have all these ethnic groups where a sort of focus on expressive individualism or self-esteem doesn't always translate for a host of groups. So this is especially important in uh, sectors like education or the law. Now, for example, according to anthropologist David Sh Jordan, shame in Chinese cultures is, is the ability to take delight in the performance of one's duty. Given Chinese and Indians dominate new migrants over the past decade, the stigmatization of shame has key uh, implications for exactly some of those sectors, like I mentioned, the education and the law. Another example I'd say is domestic violence, which in ethnic communities has considerable overlaps with maintaining perceived honor, whereas in large parts of other arenas, it's often alcohol and social disadvantage, which are a, a very strong correlates. Now, I think recent outbreaks of pandemic shaming, and a good example was the two African girls that came through Victoria and sort of deceitfully entered Queensland, they were plastered on the front page. That was a good example of pandemic shaming. And it shows on one level it is very useful in, in terms of regulating behaviour, and we are trying to regulate people into new sets of behaviours at the moment. But it shows the tension with shame. There's a tension between appropriate enforcement of acceptable boundaries to the trashing of individual dignity with no paths to forgiveness. So this has been especially pronounced in the past decade through online shaming, where a host of figures, both prominent and otherwise, have been cancelled due to some kind of inappropriate action. Now, this is where healthy shaming involves a brief period of stigma combined with an associated ritual of reintegration. Now, this is exactly what happens in group therapies for addiction or dieting. But cancel culture is narrowly about retribution. So, so the combination of online activism and permanent marks on the internet, which what I call shame's digital shadow, can, might hamper the path of reintegration. So this is something to think about, and I raise in the book that is it harder to do the reintegration in our current environment, the, the combination of digital and social media activism. So we're discussing the world of social uh, media, and this is something Monica, I'm, I'm sure, will say more, more about. Religious leaders have raised the prospect that without the concept of sin, our society lacks the structure to allow for forgiveness. Now, the alternative is ostracism and exile without the route for, for any sort of reunion. Even groups such as those for weight loss or drug addiction contain certain aspects that incorporate Christian concepts of, of forgiveness. So this way, our belief in the role of guilt as a superior emotion to regulate transgression is, is arguably under threat with the declining role of Christianity's moral axis of sin and redemption. The shame can be scaled, which can be significant when behaviours are unacceptable, but still within the law. 
especially when it comes to say corporations or governments which are not always capable or which aren't capable of feeling guilt and I argue that even something like the Hain Royal Commission, you could almost argue that was uh, almost a type of healthy shaming of the financial service industry because there was an immediate reintegration of sorts. So uh, Western societies to some extent have underplayed the role of shame. Its utility has been deemed less relevant in a social milieu of greater diversity and urban anonymity. Shame requires an audience and a shared morality, something at odds with a multicultural society. We are ashamed of shame portrayed instead as the inner demon responsible for a range of psychopathology. Yet poorly understood shame is an unnamed undercurrent that leads people to avoidance and isolation. The emotion hides in plain sight while we pretend we have superseded. As Salman Rushdie writes, <coughs> excuse me, Dear reader, shame is not the exclusive property of the East. What we often call social anxiety is steeped in shame. It's a good example of a medicalized term which has a moral undercurrent. It's one coloured by perceived failures in our media-rich meritocracy that breeds inadequacy. So in the language of evolutionary psychology, we live in an environment that encourages us into acts of social submission instead of grasping towards affiliation. So symptoms of, symptoms of emotional distress are often signals with regards to our perceived status within groups and hierarchies, many of which are now imagined online. Now our current circumstances are challenging us to renew our inner lives, just as we avoid, strive to avoid the threat to our physical bodies. The rise in discussion of mental health in recent decades corresponds with the decline in a moral metaphysical language. We increasingly lack a language for suffering and adversity. Pandemic shaming is likely to be limited to this period where coronavirus is the dominant force shaping our lives. But its re-emergence is a pointer that shame has never really left, but just lurked with alternative names or iterations. A better understanding of shame and a focus on its reintegrating potential offers promise to enliven our emotional selves. Thank you. Thank you to Jared and to Anne for their invitation to be with you today and also uh, to Dr Ahmed for his thought-provoking introduction. Being of Lebanese heritage myself and growing up in Western Sydney, I'm definitely familiar with the cultural aspects of shame. It was often said with a sense of both pride and trepidation that the disappointment of your family was a much greater punishment than any school teacher or employer or even law enforcement official could provide. For those of us who had the added benefit of being raised a Catholic, there was also the phenomenon of Catholic guilt. Now, I'm not entirely sure what Catholic guilt is and how it differs just from regular guilt, but it too was part of our understanding of guilt and shame. One which so many first and second generation Australians grew up with. So I feel right at home with today's conversation. I'm not a psychologist or a psychiatrist, so my perspective will be more along the lines of guilt and shame from a religious perspective. And my hope is that instead of affirming the suggestion that religion plays an unhelpful and unhealthy role in terms of guilt, I'll be able to challenge that. My fundamental belief is that religion is not a negative contributor, but can actually be of significant assistance into some of the ritualising reintegration uh, of shame that, that Dr Ahmed was talking about. In the weeks following his election, Pope Francis described shame as a true Christian virtue. Now, I remember being taken aback when reading these comments because shame as a virtue meant it was something to cultivate rather than something to reject. The Pope went on to explain that the virtue of shame is in contrast to its alternative, being a person who is never ashamed or shameless, as you call it. And it's a theme that the Pope has spoken often about in his pontificate, at one point, even calling the ability to feel shame not only a virtue, but the very first step to walking as a Christian. And what he was getting at, I think, is that shame is part of the realisation that you need salvation. Without it, we fall into the trap of self-justification. So if shamelessness and self-justification are obviously vices, then in some respects, it makes sense that it's correlating virtue with shame itself. But we also say that virtue lies in the middle, 
So in this case, maybe we need to find a middle ground between shame and shamelessness. And I had long thought that this was where guilt stepped in, the happy medium between these two vices. Having guilt as sort of a healthy alternative is, as, as Dr. Ahmed was saying, that guilt focuses on an act while shame focuses on an individual. Guilt says what I did was bad, shame who I am is bad. And in church circles we might hear this as the mantra of hate the sin, love the sinner. Guilt, we hope, can lead a person to take responsibility for their actions because it is the action and not the person that is deemed as wrong. Whereas shame can make us want to hide because it is the person and not the action who is the focus of judgment and condemnation. But differentiating between the action and the person is not the only way we distinguish between the two. Father Mike Schmitz, a, a popular Catholic preacher from the United States, describes a different distinction between guilt and shame. Guilt is the awareness of failing some objective standard, whereas shame is an awareness of having failed in somebody else's eyes, whether that person be God, family, others, or even ourselves. Similarly involve others, because we cannot be healed of shame on our own. We need the reintegration. We need the community to forgive us, to embrace us, and to restore us. This communal expression of healing is, is present in some cultural groups more than others, depending on the particular failing that's being discussed. But it's become less and less likely in Western societies like our own in recent years. With fewer Australians identifying as being part of an organised religion, and even fewer engaging in any type of religious practice at all, there have been significant consequences for our understanding of both sin and redemption. Indeed, there's been an implicit rejection of the notion of sin, or of any objective and immutable moral standard. We've lost an agreed set of values, a shared moral code that is both understood and enforced. And in its place have come social sins, sins against political correctness, such as the great or greatest sin of intolerance, but it's not clear that these are based on objective standards or shared values, nor that they enjoy the broad consent or even at times the broad understanding of the majority of the population. It's not even clear that everyone even enjoys the benefit of these new standards of behaviour, with those seeking to enforce the so-called virtue of tolerance, demonstrating at times a militant intolerance towards some points of view and the people who hold them. So while I once thought that this loss of a sense of sinfulness or guilt and of a shared moral code was at the heart of much of our social malaise, I think that it instead, what, what the problem is, is a, is a loss of the sense of mercy. Without a shared moral code, we cannot have a shared understanding or experience of reconciliation, redemption, reintegration. In recent times, it seems that there's a creeping unforgiveness occurring, most aptly seen as Dr. Ahmed mentioned, in what we call cancel culture. Cancel culture is so prevalent that it's now made its way into the Merriam-Webb's dictionary, being defined as having to do with the removing of support for usually public figures in response to their objectionable behaviour or opinions. This, the dictionary tells us, can include boycotts or a refusal to promote someone's work. The definition goes on to liken cancellation to a cancelled contract, in case of celebrities, a severing of the relationship that once linked a performer to their fans. If we look at recent history in Australia, we also see it manifest in the demand for people to lose their jobs, with pressure placed on corporate entities to terminate the employment of anyone who has crossed this social line. Think about the experience of Margaret Court for a minute. Whether you agree with Court's beliefs about marriage or not, the way she articulated them or not, what happened to her as a result of expressing them is educative. Her views were denounced by those who disagreed, which is a healthy part of robust public debate on any issue. But they didn't stop there. There were immediate calls for the stadium bearing her name to be renamed and a protest against any formal recognition by Tennis Australia of the 50th anniversary of court winning the Grand Slam, an otherwise incredibly proud achievement in Australian sporting history. <laughs> 
There was also bitter disappointment when Serena Williams failed to beat court's record because it meant court's achievements, unparalleled after five decades, remain part of tennis history. It was not good enough that court be criticised. There were many who wanted her legacy to be wiped from memory altogether. Cancellation and cancel culture then is not only about financial retaliation, but about a severing of a relationship between the offender and the community. And this phenomenon of being cancelled is enabled and distorted and exacerbated by social media. Enabled because social media allows a person's sins to be broadcast across the globe in a matter of minutes. Distorted because those who would otherwise be unaware of a person's offences and who are not really part of the community to which they belong can nonetheless condemn and cancel them. And exacerbated because the digital footprint of your comments or your actions remains forever, ready to be highlighted whenever convenient. Even more, some comments that might have seemed innocuous at the time they were uttered can be resurrected many years later to condemn the individual involved. With social media, it matters not whether some are willing to forgive and to restore a person's cancelled status. There will always be enough people on Twitter who will refuse to, make, refuse to show mercy and make such restoration impossible. So what does this mean for our discussion of guilt and shame? So if the remedy for feelings of shame needs to involve a person being embraced by their community, a widely practiced cancel culture can ensure that this remedy, and so this healing, can never occur. It's quite the paradox that on one hand, we've done everything possible to avoid notions of objective moral truth, while simultaneously insisting and enforcing certain unforgivable sins. Viewed in this light, I really do think that it's a loss of mercy that's even more damaging than a loss of shared values. Without the possibility of mercy, shame has nowhere to go, and in the dark, it continues to grow. In order to deal with guilt and with shame, we need a mechanism, or more correctly, a ritual of mercy. So I think this is a convenient segue into what I might call a defensive confession. I haven't written a book yet, but um, that's probably what I titled it. And in particular, the way it's practiced in the Catholic Church as a means to address both guilt and shame. Now, I might be a little bit biased, but I would go as far as to say that it's the best way to deal with guilt and shame in any age, but particularly our own. For those unfamiliar with confession, or what we call the Sacrament of Reconciliation, it involves a private confession of sin, in both kind and number, by the penitent, then giving of a penance and absolution by a priest. The priest is there present not, only, not in his own capacity, but acting in the person of Christ, and has the ability to restore the bonds broken with God, with the community, and with itself. It's ritualistic, and it is certain, with contrition being the only condition placed upon forgiveness. It's also completely private. The priest is bound to not tell anyone what was revealed, even under pain of excommunication. There's obviously been much debate about the sacramental seal with respect to crimes against children, and I do not propose to deal with that uh, this afternoon. Suffice to say that at this point, this isn't the only aspect of the sacrament that enlivens debate. Many well-meaning Christians of other denominations, and even those within the Catholic Church, will argue against the sacrament of confession and insist that a person can simply go to God in private prayer with their sin and confess it there. And in one respect, that's true. An all-powerful God can obviously forgive a repentant sinner in any way that he chooses, including if the sinner approached in private prayer. But God is the creation, creator of human nature, also knows human nature, and he knows that we need to own up to our failings, to name them, and then be assured by a member of our own community that we have been restored if we're going to deal effectively with the emotions of guilt and of shame. Catholic, Catholics believe that sacramental confession not only removes the sin, but offers the grace to amend one's life. And even those who do not believe this or really understand it, the powerful words of absolution spoken by the priest can be life-changing for those who hear them. God, the Father of mercies, through the death and resurrection of his Son, has reconciled the world to himself and sent the Holy Spirit among us for the forgiveness of sins, the priest says. Through the ministry of the church, may God give you pardon and peace, and I absolve you from your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. The individual is extended not just pardon, but peace as well, 
which I would say is an important part of the healing process. And what's more, given that it's a ritual that's been around for thousands of years and is encouraged to be engaged in it as a regular part of religious practice, it has the ability to remove the stigma around confession because, as scripture says, all are sinners and fall short of the glory of God. No one is excluded from this need for mercy, nor is anyone excluded from its reach. There's no cancel culture in Catholicism. There is no one whose transgression is so bad that it can't be forgiven. As Pope Francis continually tells us, God never tires of forgiving, but it's us who get tired of seeking that forgiveness. So despite what it sounds like, this isn't really a sales pitch for Catholicism, or at least not entirely. But it does highlight, I think, the need for a mechanism by which people can be restored into the community, not only in ethnic cultures where shame sometimes plays a bigger part, but also, importantly, and maybe especially, in Western society as well. Because if Pope Francis is right and shame is a virtue, it's only ever going to be virtuous if it exists alongside mercy. So many thanks to Tanvir Ahmed and to Monica Dumet. And now we come to questions and discussion. But before we do, I should say that, uh, as I said at the start, that we're here today on the occasion of the publication of Tanvir's book, In Defense of Shame, which is published by Connor Court. And um, we'll have signed copies available, which uh, Anne will send out in due course uh, notice about on uh, to our members on the web. But now, uh, questions and discussion. Thank you. Well, thanks, uh, Tanvir, and thanks, Monica. So now some sort of personal questions uh, have, to you, Tanvir. Ever felt shame? Oh, yeah, all the time, yeah, regularly, particularly growing up. And I talk about, in a, cult in a cultural sense, we would have specific rituals of shame where, um, you know, for I talk about as a kid where I had to grab my ears and sit back up and down whenever I did something um, wrong. So shame was a, just a natural part of how you were disciplined. And obviously in the book, I also talk about my public tr transgressions where I was, you know, things like my journalistic, I was accused of plagiarism, this kind of stuff. And that's actually an interesting example, I think, of modern shame, whereas on one level, it felt like a clumsy error at a personal level, but publicly it was very, quite variable uh, interpretations. But there's a modern um, marker, the digital marker of shame. So even though personally you're, you've sort of overcome it and on many levels you feel like you've overcome it, there's almost this digital poke of shame that keeps coming back. So that's actually, that's quite a new element. And that's part of why I think this book you know, has an extra power where I, arguably initially I didn't necessarily incorporate the personal dimension and interestingly, and you'll be interested in some of this where when it was being shopped around a little, uh, Good Weekend, a few places like this were interested in extracts and I had publicists and stuff. They're like, wow, yeah, we like the book a, a little, but you need to incorporate more personal stuff. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so, but I think that made it stronger. So I think I... Certainly from my angle, I have this interesting angle of a professional interest. As a psychiatrist, we're dealing with emotional disorders. I have the cultural angle where shame, it is far more a shame-based society than a guilt one. So Western societies, uh, one of the few societies, would see themselves as primarily guilt-based. Uh, whereas most societies in the world are probably more shame-based in the sense that they're more collectivist cultures. So I, I come very much from that angle. Uh, and then obviously I, you know, in a fairly minor way, I've also had this public realm. Uh, so the combination of that, I think, you know, gives me kind of a special access to this topic. You may or may not recall, but when you got into trouble with your plagiarism allegation, you rang me and asked me for advice. And my advice was to go away for a bit of time and um, come back and it'd be OK. But you didn't go away. You, you kept going. I think that's a marker that I never felt that's I never felt it felt very clum it felt like a clumsy error to me so that's where I never felt that deep sense of shame that I've clearly made a big plan to transgress so I think that's what kept me is a kept a really strong drive but also strong I mean that's where any sort of humiliation or shame it can go either way it can go into hiding or it can be a big motivator so I think for me it's always been a, a big motivator, I think. 
Now, with you, Monica, we'll ask a slightly different question. How much guilt have you felt? <laughs> it'll be the time you haven't felt guilt. I feel guilty all the time. Um, I think you, you have the perfect storm of, you know, um, migrant family, uh, lines of the Catholic guilt, and then I would say being a woman. I don't know any woman who doesn't feel guilty about pretty much everything. Being a, you know, bad friend, sister, mother, wife, whatever it is. And so, you know, I think I get the trifecta. Uh, now, you mentioned Pope Francis and you said he said a good word about shame, that it's a virtue, but he may be transgression, transgressing here because I think in Pope Gregory's seven virtues, shame's not one of them. So is this more heresy by a Jesuit pope or <laughs> how do you explain all this? I think that there's a, a fair bit lost in translation sometimes from the Holy Father. But um, uh, no, I think that it's just... I always say that Pope Francis has a tendency to preach to the choir. Uh, while most people think that's a waste of time, I think that um, that Pope Francis is less interested in speaking to the world if we categorise the world as outside the church and he wants to pe he's trying to pe preach solely to the people in the pews. Um, and so I think in reading some of his comments uh, in light of those is a lot... T it takes a, a bit of a different tack on it and I don't think that there's as much, nearly as much heresy uh, in what he says as other people accuse him of. Just jumping from what Monica was saying, Jared, so shame, women are more likely to feel a more sort of internalised version of shame, uh, much more likely to be self-critical. Also, from a parenting point of view, the same-sex parent, so you're far more likely to, I guess, use shame as a parent on the same-sex child. So men are far more likely to sh shame their sons and vice versa with women and their daughters. So that's an interesting trend. And there's certainly a view that male, and this is a broader argument in mental health, that men are more likely to externalise or manner of distress. So shame is often externalised for males, you know, in terms of you know, violence or aggression, that kind of stuff. So that's a, quite a difference with, you know, from a gender point of view. Monica said that she might do a book in defence of confession and made some interesting comments about that. But Monica's obviously talking about confession in a, in a religious sense, in a Christian sense, specifically in a Catholic sense. But what about in a secular sense? Is a psychiatrist much different from a confessor? No, I think it has lots of overlaps. I, I think many psychiatrists or psychologists would see themselves to some extent as the modern secular priests. And realistically, probably the majority of the population, if they had life problems, they're more likely to go to a psychologist or a psychiatrist or the GP or a social worker um, because they would see it in secular terms. They would see the, their problems of living in secular terms um, and look for help in that way. But the reality is, and this is part of the reason of the book too, because shame has a moral dimension. So there's a whole set of, of mental health disorders that will present in secular terms. They'll say, I have a trauma disorder or I have an anxiety disorder. And when you chip away, there's a moral dimension to their distress. So, for example, trauma disorders, uh, shame is often about social subordination. Um, and, and also lots of anxiety disorders are about kind of not adequately, you know, we live in a society of sort of achieved identities and meritocracy. And there's all these, there's all this. Uh, one, one thing I argue, shame historically was about not, fully, not fulfilling one's duty, whereas increasingly in our society, it's often about feeling unlovable. For, for various reasons. So that's a shift. But the other aspect of shame, when you're, when you're in an individual, say, secular confession type thing, one, a, a typical theme that I often am very interested in is how do we bring a richer language to the people I'm seeing? Because it's amazing you'll see now people with often very low levels of education talking to you in really technical medical terms. You know, they'll say, oh, yeah, I've come, I have borderline personality disorder, blah, blah, blah. And, and, the, and the, also the opposite, where they have almost no metaphysical or moral terms to think about their experience. Um, so I think that's a big gap and certainly something that would interest Monica. So in some ways, I'm often there shifting people away from the language of psychology because I feel like it limits their recovery. But the other aspect of this too, when they present, say, in some sort of secular confession, that does not suit all groups. If you're from a more collectivist type of society or if you're from a more shame honour type group, 
you it's very hard to absolve people or help them recover if they're just seen as individuals you have to think of how to involve the group and sometimes that involves various ritual you, simple ways is you bring in the family so things like family therapy or but sometimes it, it needs more than that you know it needs involvement by the local priest or the imam or and i've had patients particularly in southwest sydney in the bankstown job where you know they've had to do parallel sort of some sort of african kind of ritual etc and interestingly that can work parallel with modern western medicine so they might be on my treatments but then they need this type of ritual as well um, so the pure model of uh, religious confession while it has overlaps it arguably also has some of the limitations um, but possibly and this will be interesting with monica whether does that confession does that automatically kind of incorporate the congregation it probably does that's where it in involves the group doesn't it yeah because yeah. well the, the priest stand the priest in hearing the confession stands there in in um the name of you know name in the person of christ um and then so has that authority and the ability to restore that relationship um not only with god but with the community and so because the, the priest obviously is seen as a, a community representative um and so there is that communal aspect even in the even in the private confession i wanted to ask you you were saying that that um people don't tend to have a moral language to deal with some of their distress how do you in a in a obviously a secular clinical setting try to point them towards a moral language if that's of assistance but while keeping it secular i don't well, good. I mean, good example is I remember um, I used to fly to uh, Armadale for several years, sort of in um, in regional New South Wales, and this was I'd only qualified as a psychiatrist. We're talking you know, seven, eight years ago. And one of the first patients I'd I'd seen there, he came up to me and he says, and there was a letter from the GP just saying, oh, he, he, there was nothing really in the letter. And when I asked him what his problems were, he says, oh, I keep having affairs, doctor. Right. And I was like, I was like, why have you presented to me? I keep having affairs. And it was ridiculous. And my immediate thought was, I mean, this is ridiculous. So why is this guy presenting? But then as you took more of a history, it is interesting seeing um, uh, the overlaps. Because the reality was this guy was extremely impulsive, right? He probably didn't reach the level of an outright illness, right? And, but I had to make him both see that clearly there was a moral dimension. But weirdly, in fact, he probably, I wouldn't say he taught me, but even at the end of that, I saw there was this mix where I was actually able to improve his impulse control a little. We mm -hmm. put him on a mood stabiliser, so slightly less impulsive, and did help him in the longer term. But at the same time, I had to kind of shift him and say, look, this is not a medical problem. Uh, whereas, so a lot of people like to come to, say, psychologists, psychiatrists, to absolve themselves of responsibility. Mm. No right? So sometimes, you know, say diagnosis like ADHD, where a lot of the problem is a family dynamic or it's bad parenting or bad environment, you know. Because so, you medicalise a moral problem. Yeah, exactly. So, but the problem is you medicalise a moral problem, but the thing is often it helps too. So that almost, so people come, say it's a totally messy family, it's a messy parenting, and you still have sympathy for them, you want to help them. And on one level you say you're trying to get them to take responsibility, and you can do that. But the fact is, some of your treatments still work a little. So that sometimes that helps them go, oh, yeah, yeah, it is ADHD. <laughs> you know? So some, you've got to be careful of not entrenching their, their um, uh, lack of responsibility. So it's a fine balance. Well, Monica, t tell us about absolution. I think that was, you mentioned it. Yeah. Um, people of a certain generation are familiar with young Catholic children who sort of made up sins in order to, to get the sacrament. But what about the real thing? I mean, we, we know if you go to a psychiatrist, um, you'll talk to someone like Tanvir, uh, you'll get some advice, you may come away with some medication, like the person you mentioned in Armadale. Um, what do you come away with after a Christian absolution? Well, um, I think that the first is, is that absolution. So the. But what's it feel like? What's it feel like? Like a complete a weight is lifted off you. I, I guess that, you know, particularly in talking about shame, you, you carry around this, you know, these feelings of I'm terrible, per not only did I do the wrong thing, I'm a bad person, I'm unlovable, as you mentioned, um, 
I, you know, all of the, all of those types of things, and I need to hide. Um, so when you walk in, you're actually able to be completely upfront about that. Um, not try to put responsibility on anybody else. It's you know, you put your hand up. I did this. I own it. Um, and then receive. I, you know, you literally walk out feeling as if a, a weight has been lifted off. And you don't shoulders. need medication. You don't need medication. I do want to say though that there are, you know, I, I'm not proposing confession as a, you know, as a complete alternative yeah. to medication. There are obviously, you know, obviously in the same way that you don't want people to entrench them in bad behaviour by medicalising at the same point, at the same token, you don't want to say confession is a is a cure for every type of mental illness or every type of, you know. So you need, I would, I would say, you need both. Um, well, we've both talked about the concept of being unlovable now. I must say it was a joke, but when I was at school uh, many, many years ago, uh, a teacher who had a sense of humour, who was not a priest, he was a secular teacher, and he said, he, he said to the class that a parent had come up to him to speak about young Jimmy, who said Jimmy had an inferiority complex, and he said, no, he doesn't really, he's just inferior. Now, <laughs> are there people who are unlovable? I mean, it won't do any good if you go to the psychiatrist or you go to the priest. If you walk in unlovable, won't you also come out unlovable? <laughs> look, I guess it, it brings us to that, and Monica will be able to speak to this as well. I mean, I look, I think as a psychiatrist, you know, there's that term, if, uh, if you don't love them, you can't help them. And I think that does overlap with those Christian notions of dignity, of where, you know, every person having this sort of innate dignity. And one of the whole theories of mental health treatment is there are people who have never been loved. And some of them, your job is to try and build a connection and make them feel like there's some sort of regard. And the hope is that by essentially what mums do, you know, so, so a lot of the theory of mental health is what's called early life attachment. And arguably that sort of overlaps with notions of dignity where our first sense of dignity is just being loved by getting this sort of um, uh, non-judgmental love from mum. So both probably Christian, uh, say a priestly love and a therapeutic love has overlaps there where part of our job is, you know, our highest job to some extent is to love the unlovable mm -hmm. so, to some extent. And that and for some of them, that helps them... Uh, you know, recover to some extent and they can form relationships again. So, same true in confession? Yes, it, look, I would say same, same is true in confession, but probably in confession it's more, it, it's not necessarily unlovable but unforgivable because so many people think, you know, if anybody knew how terrible I was and really the depths of, you know, the awful person that I am. Um, so love is part of that, but also also that, you know, it's an, confession is an affirmation that, Nobody is beyond redemption. There is absolutely nobody that is a lost cause, um, which I think is works into the unlovable but also into the unredeemable. Now, as you know, in the Catholic Church, there used to be one-on-one -on -one confessions and then there was a kind of community confession and sections of the church going back to one-on-one -on -one confessions. But uh, in, in, when it was a sort of community confession, as one of our members pointed out to us, um, not unlike the very secular organisation of Alco Alcoholics Anonymous where people get an opportunity at a meeting, I think, to speak for no more than three minutes. But essentially, because I've been to one of the meetings, not as, a, not as a patient but as an observer, fortunately, but I've been to one of the meetings when I was writing about an alcoholic, uh, they seem to get great relief by telling their story over and over again, week after week, sometimes two or three times a week. Ross Fitzgerald, who we had here when his book came out about being 50 years sober, or 60 years sober. Um, he, he mentioned this. I was 50 years sober. Um, so what about Alcoholics Anonymous? Where does that fit in when you make a sort of public declaration to your friends about how bad you were when you're on the grog? I'll start if you like. But yeah, I think there are lots of overlaps with um, Christian things, be it forgiveness, but also that sense of sort of original sin, arguably, where there's this... There's these innate aspects of, uh, of man that uh, I, I, I can't entirely, that are irredeemable, to, uh, not necessarily irredeemable, but that I can't necessarily control, that I need to give up a degree of control. Uh, and, then it, and, and, then, uh, and through a group, you know, be it through a congregation, that that element is also important. That element of confession, 
um, you know, which overlaps with shame, especially when it's group facing, and then an immediate sort of reintegration of sorts. But even what you're saying, we're repeatedly going, a lot of psychological treatments overlap with prep. So what's called cognitive behavioral therapy, where you're constantly kind of doing this self-talk, challenging negative thoughts, uh, and many aspects of therapy, group therapy as well. Uh, to some extent, a lot of mental health treatments are the secularization of certain religious rituals, uh, where you're repeating the same thing, be it group. So it's things that may have worked in a religious context, made secular. So what you're, that alcoholic, that, I think that overlaps with prayer, where you're going each week, you're kind of saying something, you're, you're kind of repeating it over and over again. Uh, yeah, so that, that's where I think there is a significant overlap. So when you're looking at guilt being absolved by confession, do you see it, in, 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 what, what's the difference between doing this in a kind of communal way or doing it in an individual way? Well, I th- I, in terms of the, the communal ritual uh, as it exists in, in the Catholic Church, there's no individual confession uh, so you're sort of there and encouraged privately, you know, re- recall, to, recall to mind your sin, which is different to actually articulating. I think that there's a great merit in articulating um, sins or, or the shame that you're feeling. But I think in terms of like now call it anonymous or that type of communal environment, there's also an accountability that there are people there who will hold you to account um, and to assist you in not falling back into the same, the same patterns of behaviour. So I think that, that a communal aspect is also very beneficial um, because you know not only, you know, I'm doing something and I, you know, that I don't want to do, I'm doing, you know, falling back into a pattern of behaviour that I don't want, but also knowing that if I have this regular group meeting that I'm going to have to go back there and share that I felt. Um, and so I think that that's, uh, that's also a good motivator. I think it's always important to have people who hold, hold you accountable uh, in whatever setting. Now, you both mentioned social media, but it does... As you both acknowledge, it does change concept of shame and the specific concept of guilt because to some extent it can never it might be forgiven, but it can never be forgotten whereas in yeah, even only two decades ago, a lot of past misdemeanors were forgotten because of time unless some came across an old newspaper clipping, but not anymore so that's obviously a dramatic change so how would it affect the way you treat people? as distinct from how you might have treated them, say, even 10 years ago, when this is now much more manifest, manifest, or how does it affect people that you're dealing with in your situation? I mean, you might be forgiven by, by, by God, but you're not necessarily forgiven by the neighbour down the street. Yeah, look, it is a, certainly a bigger part of my work. I mean, obviously, it's a generational uh, component, but you know, a lot of people, if, as soon as they're under 30 or so, that becomes a bigger dimension that you have to take a big history from, you know. So, yeah, and it magnifies things. It's a bit like what I was saying, that shame can be scaled, that guilt can't, which both, it gives it both a negative and positive power. Um, uh, you know, say bullying can move from the playground onto online. So it, it, it magnifies things. It also normalises lots of psychopathology. It can normalise being a pedophile or a terrorist or, or a self-harmer. I said these raise all challenges, but one of the things I raise in the book, and, and, and to be honest, I haven't gone into it in enough detail because it's sort of a spectre of an idea, because I actually think even though we view our society as individuals, when I see people, even the loneliest people, they exist in imagined groups, but right? in their head, they're still facing a group of some kind. It could be their boss that criticised them 10 years ago. It could be their aunt, their aunt, etc., who they don't see anymore. But most people exist, we're still relational beings, which is partly why what Monica was saying, that the group-facing therapy is often more powerful than individual-facing therapy for a lot of people. But I do think increasingly now the imagined groups people live in, particularly for younger people, are online. Even if they're not actually engaging terribly much online. But how they imagine themselves, they're often thinking of that. They're thinking, oh, I'll put this up and people see this on Facebook and, or on Instagram, whatever it is. So the, group, the, the, the groups people are facing, you know, they vary from professional or neighbourhood, but increasingly, the, the, uh, especially younger people, they're facing their online group. And from the point of view of forgiveness, I mean, can you be forgiven? Well, you can be forgiven by God according to your faith, but how does that affect if the neighbour down the street finds out what you did 35 years ago and holds it against you. 
Well, that's the thing. I'm, I think that that's a, that's a real uh, challenge that we face at the moment, that we have to be able to... We have to find a way to assist people with this new... Like, look at, like this new merciless, you know, unforgiving culture that exists uh, at some point online because you can't even uh, t- turn it off. Like, I know, I'm, you know, I speak to people and I'll say, just turn your phone off. Um, if the, you know, if the argument, if the whatever is getting too bad on social media, just turn it off. But there's this knowledge that even if you're not facing the group in, in person, that they can still be having an argument with you without you present. Um, it's a really, I don't know, I th- we do need some type of uh, ritual of, of restoration. I don't know what that Well, that like is happening media. in Europe. For example, there's a law in Europe coming up the right to be forgotten or something where you can get rid of links like that. Mm. Um, but also with the neighbour, I mean, the, the reality is in an urban, you know, in a busy city, you just don't associate with them. Mm. So you can actually, and this was the argument that shame doesn't work that much anymore, potentially, because we can just disassociate from groups. If I get excommunicated from the Bangladeshi community or something, I mean, yes, it'd be upsetting, but I'd just go off and form new groups, potentially. Uh, so, it, you know, you can just not associate with the neighbour. Mm. <laughs> so it, it's not quite as... Um, whereas previously for a village or something like that, it, there's no escape. You know, you, you're kind of banished for all the time, eternity or something. Uh, you can't live your life. So in that respect, you can escape... But the online thing, so it's more online, you escape on a day-to-day level, but say going for a job, or there's, there'll be all manner of areas where, where you can't escape it. Yeah, absolutely. And going for a job, the first thing that any employee does is now... A, Google, you know, yeah, that's Google your, you and, your resume, yeah. Just a final quick question, because we're running out of time. Uh, we'll start off with you, Monica, and end up with Tanvir. Uh, you've both said uh, something favourable about shame and guilt probably restoring them a bit. Um, could we live without them? I think that we need to have something that identifies that, you know, a, a moral standard. I mean, we need a moral language, moral standard, something that identifies that a moral rule has been crossed and not in order to, to shame people for the sake of it, but because these types of things damage us. And without knowing, you know, that once I once heard it described that guilt is like, you know, putting your hand on a hot stove, feelings of guilt, it's sort of like, wow, that's, that's hurting me, I need, to, I need to take my hand off. Um, guilt is an, an emotional acknowledgement of what I'm doing is hurting me, it's hurting others. Uh, so I don't think that we can do without them altogether because I think then we just will continue to do things that, that either harm ourselves or harm, harm people around us. We live without it? Uh, no, you can't really. Because you, you can't regulate... Because we're social beings, and we're the most social beings uh, of, of anybody in the, anything in the animal kingdom, shame and guilt are the keys, key ways we regulate social behaviour. So without shame, we, we end up becoming psychopaths, and we'd potentially just kill each other, and we wouldn't care about it. <laughs> so that'd be, a, that'd be a tough place, tough way to live. And there'd be no one to buy books. So look... Um, <laughs> All the best within Defence of Shame, which is out by uh, Connor Court in Brisbane. And thanks to you, uh, Monica, and thanks, Tanvir, for, well, for you for a great paper and discussion, and for you, Monica, for a great paper and discussion as well. Well done. Thank you very much. much.